Uh, hi everyone, I'm Mason. I'm a machine learning engineer at ThoughtWorks. Um, yeah, and I'm Siobhan. I'm a data scientist at ThoughtWorks. And today we're going to share some learning we've had in a project uh, where we've had to use synthetic data uh, to train or fine-tune a very specific domain model. So they had a really specific task they needed to solve. Uh, they were kind of a marketplace and so they had a really high traffic. Uh, so the constraints were quite unique. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, as most of you would know, there's been a lot of major development uh, with AI over the past few years, uh, most of you would be aware, uh, but uh, the key advancement lie uh, is around general purpose models, so mod a big model that can solve multiple tasks. Um, and there's been quite a big focus on language and uh, like um, text data, uh, but today we're going to be talking about other modalities and more specifically images. Uh, so is generative AI only text? Uh, not really. I think if, if you've used uh, ChatGPT more recently, there's been more uh, evolution in the image space, not just image generation, image description, um, code generation, uh, and also uh, you can also have image and text as an input for another image as an output, 3D video generation. So basically generative AI is for multiple modalities, that's the key takeaway. Um, but What's the key difference between the previous models that we were using for more traditional um, AI versus generative AI? The previous models uh, were more really specific uh, for a specific problem. In the sense that if you were trying to do, uh, recommend a song to someone, you would have to train the model based on a various set of songs and people preferences uh, to get, the, get, get a specific prediction. Uh, and these general purpose model, uh, the great thing about them is they've been trained on so many different things that they can solve so many different problems. So if you're in a situation where you just don't have data, you're a startup, you, you just have just not da no data available for the problem you're trying to solve, they're kind of a good data source. <laughs> so um, it's also become widespread, like we said, for uh, video regeneration more recently, the OpenAI Sora. Uh, this is like a video generated by the model based on a text description. Uh, and this is like a picture of a cookie that Google Gemini can generate a recipe based on the cookie. I, I haven't tried the recipe, but uh, uh, seems quite all right <laughs> based on the look of it. Um, so multimodal AI uh, can solve a range of problems that people don't necessarily think about. Um, if you're trying to, for instance, uh, focus more on your employees and more uh, operational tasks, uh, you can uh, do video skills development and build training that is a bit more interactive. So, for instance, with voice, like podcasts and so on. Uh, you can also uh, design campaigns using image generation. A bunch of the talks today use uh, image generated models for more creative uh, purposes. Uh, you can also have um, a translation, that's speech to text again, uh, to generate different uh, languages, different, uh, have different um, subtitles for different people and different languages for them. But um, the problem with this general purposes model, like the OpenAI one, the Google one, uh, they tend to be quite expensive, especially on the multimodal AI applications. So if we especially image and video tasks, they take longer, the inference time are sometimes quite long. So if you have like a marketplace and you need something that's quite high in traf traffic, uh, this is not something you can uh, use in production. Uh, so it's great for POCs, but um, it will drive up cost, and the cost is not only monetary, but it's also in terms of performance. Uh, and even if the cost will decrease over time, uh, we're talking about a project that we did a year ago, so nowadays it's already cheaper to do what we we're trying to achieve, uh, but it's still, um, it's still something you'd have to optimize for because uh, it can quickly drive up. Uh, so you need to do a good business case. It's very important uh, to look at the ROI for your use case, especially when you're trying to process images. Um, ROI for AI is actually very, very low. Uh, it's not the most profitable technology, actually. Uh, so it's quite important to look at uh, the business case. And if you don't have a business case, there are technical ways, like we're going to be talking about today, uh, to reduce these costs. Uh, so if you have a really specific uh, domain-specific task and you're trying to solve a problem, the problem we're going to be talking to you about is really just image labeling for specific type of images. So like um, uh, we'll, we're going to be talking about street views. Uh, and if you use a general purpose model just to do some sort of classification or labeling, 
uh, it's quite excessive. So do you really need to use like such a big <laughs> sledgehammer uh, to opening a nut? Not really, like that's not what you would do. So using the most state-of-the-art tool to solve something domain specific is not necessarily recommended and specifically not in our case. Um, so there are uh, pros and cons to using each method. This is kind of the rule we've been following. So large closed source models, so kind of these are the OpenAI and ChatGPT models we've been talking about. Uh, they're very versatile, very powerful, uh, but small open source models. So if you're trying to use a, a model that's been developed by the community, they tend to be more cost effective. You can quickly fine tune them for uh, more custom fit uh, purposes and they are more private because you're self hosting them. Uh, whereas the large closed source model is going to be more resource intensive, less flexible, uh, and you might have privacy concerns depending on your setup. That, that actually depends. Uh, small open source model, however, do have quite a, a lot of inconvenience. Uh, they are limited in scope. Like I said, it's really for domain specific tasks. They are less powerful. Uh, and you will need to set up more infrastructure like ML operations around them uh, and have to maintain them. Because um, as we said, it's a rapidly evolving uh, industry. So maintaining those models, updating them is quite a lot. So your model might become redundant very quickly. So it's a, an additional effort. Um, okay, so um, first up, like when we get into the technical details, we're gonna take a little bit of a deeper dive into um, an open source model called CLIP, which is, comes from OpenAI. Um, it's been pre-trained on about 400 million uh, text image pairs from the internet. Um, and a key takeaway hopefully you'll see from this is that um, the model itself learns the visual concepts from natural language um, supervision. Um, for the next few examples, we've just used um, a landscapes data set from Kaggle. So it just has like over 4,000 images of landscapes like this beach, um, hills, mountains, um, that sort of thing. Um, so the actual model itself is this like long word called clip bit base patch 32. <laughs> so what does all that mean? Because <laughs> um, clip is a multimodal, it contains both a text and an image encoder. Um, this is multimodal. So the text encoder itself basically has this transformer architecture, which depends how many people are familiar with it. It's just a deep learning architecture, the same architecture used by LLMs like GPT. But in essence, it's going to take a text, piece of text, a sentence, in this case, pepper the Aussie pup and it's gonna convert it into a vector of numbers. And so the image encoder is actually um, VIT. It's just a vision transformer. So instead of processing text, it processes patches of pixels, and in this case, the patch size is 32. So the smaller the patch size, you get higher resolution. Um, and so now we've got basically text and image vectors in the same vector space. Um, and then in comes the clip part, <laughs> which is contrastive language image pre-training. Um, and so in this case, when the model's being trained, um, the goal is to maximize the vector similarity between the matched text and image pairs, so between the image of the Aussie pup and the text, but also at the same time to minimize the similarity between mismatched text and image pairs. So if you've got the image of the dog and a text about bus, it's gonna be further away. Um, maybe a little bit of an example to like visualize the vector space here using our landscapes data set. Um, so here we've got basically an image of a surfer walking along a beach and a piece of text that says surfer walking along a beach. So these vectors are close together in this dual uh, multimodal like vector space. Um, they should be further away from the image of the mountain or a piece of text about a camel walking on sand dunes. And okay, this is just the example of the vector space for our landscapes, but obviously you've got 400 million, you've got a vast sort of vector space with all your images and text. Um, and so a common use case for this model um, is called zero-shot image classification. Um, and so here you just give the model like a list of labels, You've got the three labels up there. Um, and then you give basically all your images, it's gonna turn them both into vectors and based on the similarity between each label and the image, it will produce a probability for that label. So of course you see you've got a 96% probability that that image is a beach. Um, this one is nine, a mountain, 79% probability this is the countryside because this probably like, looks like a little bit of mountains in there as well. Um, right. um, and the zero shot aspect comes from the fact that we haven't trained the model using this particular data set. Obviously it's been trained on a vast amount of images and text on the internet so it has this zero shot capability. 
And then another use case for this is multimodal search. So in this case, you have your piece of text, light streaming through the canopy. Um, again, it's converted into a vector, and then it's compared for similarity against all the you know, vectorized images you have in your database, and then it's just gonna rank them top to bottom. So if we get the first like sort of four outputs here, we've got like light streaming through the canopy. Um, and this sort of starts to come towards the natural language processing part. So we haven't specifically stated trees. We've got a canopy, so you know, we've got semantic meaning in there. Um, um, and indeed, uh, CLIP does provide this link between textual semantics and um, visual representation. So the search term for this particular set of images was a place for a pirate to bury treasure. And so we get back beaches, but actually we get back quite abandoned beaches. There's no surfers in these beaches. Um, and it's actually this sort of link that CLIP provides that um, makes it actually part of the architecture of DALL-E 2, which is a generative model. So CLIP itself is not generative. It's not giving you a new image or a text data. But um, basically, it's the first step in DALL-E. It basically takes your text prompt, converts it into this vector space that also has like understanding of images. And then that's passed to a diffusion model where you generate your new image. Okay, right. Um, so now we know a little bit about the model itself. We're gonna finally get to fine tuning it for our domain specific task. Um, and this is basically just a toy example um, that we got. So our example here will be a text to image search um, of London Street View images. Um, and here as well, we're going to then show you how to, you can use this, this foundational models to actually generate a synthetic label data set. So this is like the very basic process to be able to fine tune a model, which basically when you're fine tuning this pre-trained model, um, it's going to tune the parameters within the model. So these are just the mathematical variables within the model. And so it's going to tune them slightly. So it's basically going to tweak this vector space. Um, and then you can be adapted to be more specific to your new task, which will be London Street View images here. So the first step is to actually have like a label data set of image text pairs. And then obviously with a client, you'll have a very domain specific uh, data set. Then you fine tune, evaluate. Um, and then finally we have the use cases that we've kind of already looked at. Um, but because you've got like basically vector embeddings of your images, you can also use the same outputs for image to image search and not just text to te text to image. Um, and then very briefly about the example data set that we used. Um, it's this Kaggle data set, um, GSV Cities data set. Um, it was a very, very large data set that was used to train a deep learning model for like visual place recognition, meaning it had like about 12, over 12,000 images of street views of London, but it also had you know, many or similar amounts of street views of Los Angeles, Barcelona, Osaka. The only labels in the data set are the city that it's from. And then basically, I just took the, the London ones and said to make this small um, example. And here, 5,000 of the images were used for the Gen AI labeling, and the remaining 7,000 are used in the examples that you're going to see. Um, and then I have the word mundane there because basically, it's not basically, you know, like the sites of London that you'd easily recognize. It's very boring street views, which um, you'll see next. Uh, so this is the performance of the base models or the foundational model uh, on the street views. So if you put residential street, the model could already detect the residential street. So already doing a good job, no need for fine tuning, I guess. Um, it could find pubs. Good, we're in London, <laughs> I hope you can find pubs. Uh, so the model did a good job here, so no need for fine tuning. Uh, but we had specific requirements. Let's say uh, uh, in our toy example, we needed to find uh, shops. The, you'll see in a bit that the model wasn't very good at finding shops. This is something where we don't really have a label for it, so we don't have really the time uh, for having hundreds of people to tag the data set and say this is a shop, this is a shop, this is a shop. Uh, so what we've done is um, use uh, GPT-4 to label the data. Uh, when we started our project, um, GPT-4 Vision had just came out, and the latency were huge. We had a lot of API rate limiting. The amount of tokens you could do was really, really limited. It was really experimental back then. Uh, but we wanted really good description of the images because the more data you get on this image, uh, the better it is for the future if we want to do more things with these descriptions. Uh, so we generated um, uh, descriptions with using the most uh, up-to-date model in terms of image description. 
you can craft your prompt any way you want. So right now we could have just told the model, can you just give me a single label uh, and this is what I'm looking for. Uh, but this was a personal choice to have longer description and then extract from it uh, uh, the label. Uh, so we've passed to the model uh, the images, got it to give descriptions. Uh, we then had a couple of us look at the performance, see if there was anything wrong about it. Actually, there was a few wrong things with it, so we ha had to make sure we removed those samples from our data set. But uh, the great thing about using a foundational model is you just don't need thousands of labels. Uh, at least, I think we just had 400 images to fine tune our model was enough. Uh, so it's relatively small uh, for these type of tasks. Uh, so, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Do you want to click it? <laughs> Okay, yeah, and so to get the slight nitty gritties of fine tuning, but mainly to say that this clip model that we were fine tuning is actually a very small model. Um, so it just has over 151 um, million parameters, so the mathematical variables within, within the model. And for scale, GPT-3 GPT has about 175 billion. Apparently, GPT-4 is estimated at like 1.8 trillion. Uh, GPT-4 mini, which is what we use to label the data set in this example, is apparently about 8 billion, so it's quite small for a GPT. Um, and then we were able to fine tune the, the clip model using our, well, roughly 5,000 image text pairs. We've got like a training and a test set, um, just like locally on an M1 MacBook. Um, so this like sort of speaks to the kind of infrastructure that you might need in terms of cost to fine tune or deploy this model. Um, and as we heard earlier today in the morning, the, the more efficient and fewer resources you use, it can also be better for the environment. <laughs> um, so the model, the results you're going to see was just three epochs of fine tuning. So just three rounds through the training data to like tweak the parameters. Um, and you get like a training accuracy of um, 0.9, which kind of you'll see here. Um, and then you can evaluate and compare the fine tuned model um, against the base model with this mean reciprocal rank. Um, what that means is given like a text description, um, does it directly match accuracy, directly give you back in the top one, the image that was part of that image text pair. So that's top one, which is kind of like accuracy. And you can see it increases from like 0 0.53 to 0 0.89. And then the others is just like, if you have a text description, does the model return the correct image in the top three, the top five, top 10, et cetera, because you kind of rank, you're just ranking. So it's like a little bit looser. Um, but yeah, but like obviously it's more interesting to look at just you know some examples of the output. So this is the base model when you look at shopping area. I think the first one is I think it's close to Common Garden, so it's kind of a shopping area. But a lot of them are just streets. It's like in a garage at the bottom here, so it's not um, so great compared to pubs, for example. Um, but the fine tune model does find lots of shops. So Sainsbury's is a very popular grocery shop. We've got Pret, which is also where you would like a coffee shop. Um, so yeah, so now you can see like the fine tuning on a relatively small data set locally took, you know, only three epochs. Um, this other, like maybe it's sort of less exciting, but like looking for bicycle parking, you can see the top image is actually like scaffolding for building works, but maybe it could look like where you could tie your bike. Um, but there are definitely bicycles. I think the corner image here is a picture of a bicycle, but there's definitely some bicycles and some things you can tie your bike to. Um, but the fine tune model does produce largely, you know, parked bicycles or areas you can park the bicycle or tie it to. Um, I think that's it for me. Uh, so the key takeaway uh, for this talk is if you have a problem where you have, you need very good performance, you need to have the flexibility to optimize the model. Uh, you want the model to be relatively low memory so that it can have faster inference speed. Uh, you also need to do quite a, a traditional like um, ML use case, like just labeling an image. Uh, well, the good thing about these uh, open source foundational models that have been made available is they remove all of the data set curating uh, from your hands because now we have all these more accurate uh, Gen AI models who are much better at generating synthetic data those you can use to fine tune then your model uh, and then uh, rapidly deploy it to production. It does come at a quite a high cost in terms of uh, MLOps uh, purposes. So you have more infrastructure you need uh, to manage. Uh, you also have to maintain the model, as we said, um, and uh, scale it over time. But they would technically scale better because they are smaller uh, in size. And a special thanks to Andy, uh, who was part of the project with us and uh, helped us quite a bit. <laughs> All right, any questions? Well, happy